Hi, I'm Rob from Kimpex, joined today by Brian from Arai. Brian? Rob? Thanks for joining us here today. I appreciate you having us on. We have uh, some exciting news here, which is the reveal of the Arai XD5, which is replacing the? XD4. XD4, which I rode for 10 years straight. So I'm very excited for this new helmet to come out. First of all, I want to ask you, how long did the Arai XD4 exist for in its form? In its current form, it's been about almost 10 years. Um, but it's actually an evolution of the XD3 before right, it. Yeah. It's, a, it's a subtle change, but it was a, a, a it looks subtle, but it was actually a, a quite an, an improvement over the XD3. But if you c consider the two the same, it's about a 20 year history in that model type. Yeah, um, right. And before that, there was the, uh, the XD, and then before that, there was the DS, which was the original dual sport back in the late 90s. Uh, we were a little ahead of the game. Uh, there was no real adventure community at that time, so that helmet right. kind of went away because there was no market for it. And the XDs kind of grew up in the market as it evolved. But 20 years, we evolved what I consider to be the perfect adventure tour helmet. Yeah, I first saw the XD3 um before i got the xd4 and then by the time it was time for me to actually purchase one i purchased the xd4 and i rode it for 10 years very happily um, my first quality helmet that i ever owned 23 years ago was also an awry mm -hmm. but it was for the street and then i then i upgraded to the uh, the xd4 so this is very exciting for me and probably anybody who's ever ridden that helmet it's a it's a benchmark in the industry and i can't wait for you to tell us a little bit about this new model yeah, it's, uh, it, it was concerning. The XD4 was such an iconic stable or staple in the industry. Uh, people loved it. People had generations of XDs, you know, mm -hmm. one after another. Uh, and I've had some people say, ah, you know, it's not done much. It's the same helmet. I'm, I want to move on to something more modern, more tech, you know, something that has more to offer. And inevitably they come back and say, yeah, I've tried other helmets. And even though they're newer, have more tech, more features, more benefits, more trends, the XD was still a better helmet, and they always came back to the XD, which always, you know, fortified my belief that Arai agonizes over the little details and improves, you know, over years. Little improvements make a better helmet, and it's mm. proven when people realize the helmet is a better helmet. Even though they think it's older and hasn't really evolved much, it has evolved into the best helmet on the market. So when it came time to improve it or change it, go to the XD5, I was extremely worried that we might make a mistake. You know, how do you improve what is considered the best helmet on the market? So I, I feared that we would stumble and possibly go the wrong way. So I, I, I was really nervous when I first took it uh, for a test ride in Japan. We did, uh, I think, 500 kilometers uh, through the mountains and highways and, and streets of Japan. And I was really impressed. I was amazed at how well they did. I was so impressed that it was a new generation of R&D who weren't involved in the first XD and they, right. they, they they paid homage to it. They paid attention. They were worried about messing it up themselves. So they were very careful, very meticulous, and they improved every aspect of this helmet. And I was quite relieved and very excited to now introduce the XD5 to the market. Yeah, it's, I think it's very important for companies when they have something that works that well. And there are many other brands, you know, even in the motorsports companies who, who they don't make massive changes. What they do is they refine what they already have and therefore um, end up with an incredible product that's also extremely reliable. And what I've found too is that as I've ridden many helmets uh, uh, in my lifetime, is that when you have new tech and new gizmos and gadgets, you have to remember that every time you add a gizmo or gadget or feature or function, that's another function that can break. And modern cars are like that. All of a sudden, you know, you know you can't, there's no more key, there's a button. But then when there's no electrical, you have a problem. So I think mm -hmm. the evolving of something that works uh, is the best formula for a quality product. Yeah, taking too big of a leap can be a negative. It could be a step backwards if it's a failure. If it's the wrong direction, you've got to pull back and, and, and redo it. So Arise always been very much of don't overreach, just add a little bit. In case it's the wrong direction, mm -hmm. the rest of the helmet's still there to, to perform. And it's not a horrible mistake. It's a little one that we can correct going forward. We don't do white sheet. You know, we don't just wipe, wipe the slate clean and make a new helmet from the ground up. You're giving away all your your, your hard-earned technology and, and experience. Agreed, yeah. So the helmet looks completely different, but it truly does rely on the core foundation that the XD set for it. Uh, and they just improved it basically everywhere. Uh, and it's always been the right philosophy, the evolution, like you said, adding little minute increases mm -hmm. in every aspect of the helmet. But in a rise world, first and foremost, it's always about protection. Everything we do adds to protection. We do nothing to take away from protection. Therefore, ride us and have those 
trendy features or conveniences that people want these days because one, if they don't add to protection, we don't do it. In some cases, they actually make the helmet less protective. You have to accept or compromise mm -hmm. to give up protection for a convenience. And Ryan will never do that. So we've always talked about if you need a convenience or a feature that you know, isn't necessarily important to a helmet's function or protection, there are other manufacturers that will do that. They, they, they will make mm -hmm. those helmets for you. Arai will not. Arai is always about the best protection. Following that, the best performance. We always talk about, we believe Arai does the best in an impact because we think about the real world and how you ride and how you crash. Right. But should you never crash, we believe Arai will be the best helmet you've ever worn because it's more comfortable, more stable, it's quieter. It's, it lets you ride longer. We never want a ride to be the reason why you want to stop riding. We don't want a ride to be the reason why, you know, I've got to pull over and take a break, take this helmet off and, you know, rub that red spot on my forehead. We don't want to be that company. We want the helmet to disappear. <laughs> we want you to forget you're wearing it and just ride as long as you want to ride because your weekends are short. You only have so much time to ride. We want you to maximize your, your, your fun and your riding experience. I have to agree, after riding those helmets for 20 years and other brands as well, that, that, that attention to detail and the craftsmanship is, a, is quite different. It's the comfort level. I remember the first one I ever bought, uh, which I brought here, I'll show you a little later, um, my retired helmet. The comfort of it is incredible. And the funny thing you mentioned about that spot on your, on your forehead, there are some helmets that I have that when I take them off, there's like a permanent mark on my, my forehead for the next like hour or so. Um, which didn't happen with the Arai. So I think the attention to detail is definitely there. Yeah. Arai labored over every aspect of every helmet. When we first came to the U.S. in racing, they quickly realized that Japanese helmets didn't fit American head shapes. And that's when we first realized head shapes around the world are different. So Japanese, Oriental, Asians have more of a round head. Uh, European, Anglos, and Americans tend to have a narrow, longer head. So we, had, we created different shaped interiors and then evolved that over decades. Um, yeah. America is the melting pot of the world. Every time somebody from Europe, you know, marries somebody from Asia and they have a kid, they're creating a new head shape. So we're always chasing the evolution of head shapes because people accuse us, why don't you just pick one and, 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 and go with it? You know, pick a size or pick a shape and go with it. I'm like, well, we're constantly making new shapes. We can't just stay in the mud. We have to pay attention. And by doing that, we think we fit more people more comfortably straight out of the box. There are subtleties you can change to modify and tweak and, and, and customize. But out of the box, most of our racers now wear helmets out of the box. Box stock mediums, a guy who has a, a skinny face might get thicker cheek pads. But for the most part, they're wearing box stock helmets because of the decades of R&D we've put into research, trying to chase the elusive human head shape that is, again, constantly evolving. You, uh, for some reason, the, uh, the I must have that standard head shape. Because when I put them on, they fit perfect. There's yep. no adjustments needed. I've never even thought about it. So uh, good for my head. Yeah. Hopefully good for yours too. What I was happy to see when I saw this helmet, because I've been waiting to see it for a very long time, is 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 that the, it's not the departure is not so far from the clean lines mm -hmm. of my XD4. I do see some like just to my eye. I see some differences. I see that there's a lot bigger space here for the air to flow mm -hmm. underneath the visor. I see that the visor's bigger. Mm -hmm. It looks like there would be more uh, visibility. Um, also here at the front of it, I see that the Arai symbol itself looks to have a vent, which maybe you can talk about, but it's kind of a cool looking feature. And the vent here system looks a bit bigger as well. Basically the, the, the evolution of the helmet, we pay attention to feedback. You know, we're always evolving. One of the things that you don't normally see on a helmet is the helmet that starts out as an XD4 by the time we got to the next generation or the next Snell, say, Snell 2010, 2015, 2020, um, we're constantly evolving the helmet. So it's pretty much ready for that next standard. We don't have to scramble to meet the next standard. Right. So we're always evolving the helmet, always learning. And that goes to some of the features. While they don't change like the peak, we plan forward. We know the feedback on the peak. And this peak has a much larger gap for more airflow, less drag, mm -hmm. but also less potential for high pressure uh, whistling. Uh, some people, depending on the fairing you're riding behind, your riding position, your shoulder, your, your neck height, the jacket you wear, all of that affects the aerodynamics. So we're trying to, we can't address it 100% for everybody, by, but by opening that, uh, that, that gap, it's a better chance for the air to escape without creating wind noise or whistling. So that basically helped in that regard. We also made the peak much more adjustable as far as its range of motion. It goes much lower yeah, that's... To, to block the, a setting sun. So you get a lot more coverage than the previous one. And the previous one did offer a tremendous amount of coverage. So it's just, again, 
people ask for more coverage, we gave them more coverage. Uh, so it's one of the things you listen to your customers. We ride a lot. Most people at Arai ride. Mr. Arai continues to ride to this day, constantly testing his helmet and adding his input because it, it is his name on the helmet. So he has a lot of input, and a lot of say. And in fact, he has the final decision on everything that, that happens at Arai. So his goal to the, to, or his direction to the R&D and the entire staff is always honor the Arai name, make it better, always make sure that we don't regret making a decision. Mm -hmm or we get negative feedback. We want positive feedback because people look up to a ride to, to make the best helmets in the world. Exactly. I didn't check inside underneath the helmet uh, what kind of ring, if you're still stuck with the D. Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. So it's still the classic D-ring that I've always had in uh, all my helmets. There's speculations on making things like this simple, like easier with the, the quick release systems and stuff like that, but it's just a system that's never failed and it's a system that's never broke on me. Uh, even my 23-year-old helmet, it would still work completely yep. perfectly like it did at day one. So that's kind of cool that they kept with that as well. Well, we get feedback and requests for quick, quick release buckles you know, yeah. all the time. And I basically say, you know, the KISS you know, method, keep it simple, stupid, right? So the issue is double D-ring is, is, like you said, it's old school, it's the original. It's basically the most simple system you could think of. And under tension, the double D-ring grabs the strap tighter. It gets tighter. Sure, yeah. When you put quick releases, you're introducing a potential point of failure. Springs break, they rust, the plastic fatigues, the clips, all of those things have potential mm -hmm. risk factors, not just because of the design of the materials, but your care. A lot of people don't take great care of their, their helmets. They use chemicals that mm -hmm. some say is safe on everything, but maybe not everything. You don't know if it's safe on all plastics or all materials. So we run the, the issue of this is one of the most important aspects of a helmet. You got the shell, you got the liner, you got the chin strap. Yeah. Three of the most important things. You don't mess with the shell. You don't mess with your liner. You damage your liner, replace the helmet. You damage your shell, replace mm -hmm. the helmet. You damage your chin strap, replace the helmet. And you don't ever want to take away any potential uh, protection from any one of those three points. And one of them is the double D-ring. It is the most robust, most reliable system. Therefore, I will always stick with it. I, I have no problems with the D-ring. It's so second nature for me to do yeah. a D-ring that it's probably as fast as a quick release. I don't even think about it. I've done it so yeah. millions of times in my life. Yeah, I and mean, I, it's just what I do it, yeah. to, to hook a helmet on. So the issue is 30 or 40 seconds of convenience. You might have to take your glove off. You know, the little tab helps you pull it and release it. It's, it is fairly simple, but again, it's one of those convenience issues. People want convenience, and I get that, but this is the most important piece of safety equipment you're ever going to buy, in my opinion. Therefore, forego the convenience for 30 seconds of time, do due diligence, undo the strap, do the strap correctly, do it nice and snug, the two finger method, make sure you've got a little gap, not too loose, yeah. you don't want it too tight. But in the end, the strap keeps the helmet on your head mm -hmm. and you don't want to mess with that because if the helmet's not on your head, it can't protect you. So it's one of those things where again, convenience factor, a, a feature or a fashion item, it's not something we do, everything we do is about protection. So when people complain about it, uh, my answer is, you know, I, I'm sorry, but we're about protection. If you need it, go somewhere else. I'm sure someone else can do it for you. I prefer reliability over convenience because I like when things work and they don't break. It really bothers me when I purchase products. I'm willing to spend more on a quality product that's going to function for longer uh, than the opposite. So for me, I'd stick with that for sure. Yeah. Um, no question about it. Um, uh, so tell me a little bit, maybe a few of the features that have evolved from the X-D4. Okay. Well, I, I didn't really touch on you know, a couple of points when you, when you first looked at it. So I talked about the peak, obviously mm -hmm. the gap, uh, the range of motion. Um, but the issue we deal with on this helmet is a lot of the people riding adventure touring bikes are riding behind large fairings. And large fairings mess aerodynamics and create wind noise. So it's one of those things where I, I talk to people about, well, your helmet's noisy on, on my bike. You did it wrong. I'm like, well, no, there are thousands of people on, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on different motorcycles, different riding positions. Mm -hmm. We can't get it correct for everybody. So we try and do the, the best we possibly can. You have to think about it. After we've created this aerodynamic package, the second you put it on your head and get on your bike, you've ruined all our hard work. You're, you're adding features into the mix that we could not anticipate. So we try and do everything to not interact poorly with uh, aerodynamic uh, turbulence. So again, the higher uh, opening, larger gap, we try to get the peak that will help force air that is uh, hitting the front of the helmet to capture the high pressure from the forehead underneath this logo vent and into two 10 millimeter holes underneath this vent. In the past, we never put uh, holes in the forehead because you don't want to weaken this area, which is already weakened by the giant eye port. Mm. Uh, this is also where most impacts happen in the front because of course you're moving forward 
we tend to lead with your head. So we never wanted to put holes here. In the past, putting holes down low by the eye port uh, was a way to get ventilation. And because it was out of the impact zones for standards, you kind of got away with it, but you're introducing two large holes right by the edge of the eye port, which could create cracks and fractures and basically the, the shell could fail. So our mission in doing this was to capture the high pressure in the, that area, but direct it up to our two 10 millimeter holes that are up inside the stronger part of the shell, which is by the way, uh, tested by DOT and Snell and all the standards around the world. So we had to make sure the shell was strong enough to withstand those two holes. Every hole we have in our shell is tested just like the solid shell is tested. When we do a penetration test, we do a penetration test on the shell. We also do it directly in every single hole to make sure that they're performing equally as well. And when we test the shell and the holes, there is no difference. The test standard cannot tell if we're testing a hole or a shell. Wow. That's how strong our shells need to be. So we basically found a way to get the holes up into the stronger area of the shell, away from the eye port, so it won't migrate cracks to the eye port. Uh, but it's in the strike zone on the testing standards. We had to make sure hmm. it, could, it could withstand that. So increased ventilation without taking any uh, protective capacity away from the helmet. So again, we did something because it allowed us to improve without taking anything away from protection. So that's the first thing we did here. Now, depending on the bike you're riding and the fairing you're behind, you may not get maximum uh, effectiveness out of this vent because it's quite low in, in your, your riding position. Um, so sometimes when you change the peak down, it could force more air in, or as it forces air over the top, it creates a vacuum through this hole that actually forces more air in. It's quite a challenge to find that perfect balance, but you can play with the peak to see how much you can improve ventilation even behind a large fairing. And then to that, we added this fairly small vent. I kind of looked at it when I first saw it thinking, Man, how much could that possibly do? It's so low profile, but it's remarkable. The styling of this vent actually increased ventilation. When you open this vent, you can feel the airflow. Right. So being up on top, it is going to get more benefit from the flow over a fairing, uh, a little bit more than this one. So it works extremely well putting air into the helmet. But most importantly, the flutes on this aero fin on the back basically draws a tremendous amount of vacuum venturi air out of the helmet um, that creates a negative pressure inside the helmet that allows whatever air can get inside to flow more freely. So pushing air into the front of the helmet's okay, but without getting rid of it, you're just damming up fresh air. But you need to have that negative pressure so that this fresh air in the front can flow through exchanging the hot air you're creating with fresh, cool air coming in. So it's a one piece instead of the two piece uh, of the old XD4. It's got uh, the functionality of all the vents in one instead of left and right. Um, but basically when I ride, even in cold weather or rain, I leave that vent open all the time just to constantly exhaust the heat that I'm creating. Uh, I've never had the need to close those vents. I feel the same. I haven't, I don't recall closing them very often. So it's just it keeps the helmet fresh. Even in colder temperatures, I don't, yep. closing them up wasn't, uh, on my old helmet wasn't beneficial yep. really. In, in the rain or cold, you close the front vent so the intake isn't really in, you know, in your face, basically uh, forcing cold or rain into the helmet. But by creating that negative, it scavenges airs wherever it can. Air will come in from underneath. It will start to filter through the headliner. It will mm -hmm. find air to exchange. So it's just a nice way to monitor and keep things at, at a nice even temperature. The rear exhaust port tier vents, they don't have covers. Basically, they're just sculpted shell. Um, they constantly also cre create a negative pressure to keep the your neck and your ears a little bit cooler. Um, I also believe that, as you said before, simple is better. You know, taking away another piece that you know you might have to replace or or, or will come off or oh, whatnot. Sure. So we basically got rid of that, basically for simplicity's sake. I also find that it looks cleaner, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and also with a smoother transition, it has less of an aerodynamic uh, aggressive effect. I believe it's also a little bit quieter because these holes basically direct right back to your ear. Mm -hmm. So if any noise is generated back here, it might go rack to your ear, you'll hear it more than you might any other. So the ventilation basically similar, but different, improved. Uh, peak is improved for aer aerodynamic effect, sun uh, effect, uh, less pull, less uh, wind whistle or roar. And then of course the chin vent's been improved. Um, the aperture in the shell was improved so much that, and the, the vent itself was improved with much larger slots, that the airflow increased enough that we could get rid of the side vents that were on the XD4. Mm -hmm. So we strengthened the chin bar without losing ventilation effect. So that was another benefit of, again, the evolution of style and design um, without taking anything away from the helmet itself for, the, for its main purpose of protection. The peak, uh, I'm sorry, the shield, it's a little bit wider than the previous one, 
I don't know how much taller it is, but it is slightly taller. But one of the things we did was now is we removed the brow vents on this yeah. helmet. Yeah. Uh, because if you're wearing goggles, the brow vents can get in the way of some of the larger goggle frames. Mm -hmm. Also, the fact that we have the upper uh, forehead logo vent, um, we felt that it was okay to, to remove those vents. We didn't lose too much ventilation effect, but we enlarged the eye port for people who wanted to wear goggles. Um, the radius of this shield has also been smooth and, and, and made more gentle, so it's a much um, more enjoyable field of view. Uh, it's got the full max cavity uh, for the pinlock lens, which mm -hmm. comes in the box now, so this helmet will come with the pinlock lens in the box. Um, and of course, we basically made it easier to change the shield. So you can just pop this off, switch the shield out, and then you can pop this back on. Let me see if I can do it from this way. You just have to turn it around and look at it. But basically, that was one of the things. The two, the two screws on each side was always a little bit more of a challenge when you're on the road. But this allows you to just pop, pop it off, pop it back on, and you're good to go. So that's a, a huge advantage over the previous generation. Sure. And should you want to just go with the peak, you have to remove these caps with screws and then put the peak on. If you want to run the shield alone, you remove the cap again and put those covers back on the shield. So quick change shield is easy. Going for peak or shield alone, it's a couple of more minutes with, the, with the, the screws like in the old method. But the average rider just wants to swap shields at the end of the day, um, and it's just super simple. When it's not simple, of course, what you end up doing is just not changing these parts, which is what I did. I just left the peak on. That's it. Um, because you need to just take two, was it two screws for to the yeah, two on each side. Two yeah. on each side, yeah. So I just left it on. Yeah. But I love the fact that you can just pop it off at any point too. That's great. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things people have been asking for for a long time. And I was trying to figure out how were they going to do it. You know, it's it's um, again one of those things where they didn't add any bulk to the system. Mm -hmm. We didn't go. We didn't do any deep recesses into the shell that would in, in, uh, inhibit the shell right. strength or encroach on the interior that takes away from the EPS liner, gets a little too close to the head. Uh, again, performance for protection is key. So we made a, a better shield system or ch a changing system without changing the shell dimensions, if you will. Um, so again, it's one of those things where it was nervous when I, when I heard about they were making a quick change. I was like, okay, that's great. And I was really impressed when, when they came out with it and I was able to do it extremely quick in my first, my first try uh, without much education. So I was thrilled. Um, the helmet itself uh, has a completely different look to it. If you notice, the bottom is much more oval or egg-shaped. So instead of that narrow profile like a, a motocross helmet would have, it's got the typical awry egg shape, which is uh, paramount to strength. Um, under flex, the, 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 the shell itself will withstand quite a bit of flexing. And under impact load, the more this is curved, the more that it will flex outward. Instead of if the chin bars are too straight under impact, the energy goes straight back. It goes straight down those lines instead of flexing and absorbing and dissipating energy. So we went more with the, uh, an egg shape for strength like our street helmets all have. So it's a little bit more in line with the typical awry um, egg shape, more natural uh, organic shape, if you will, which basically lend, uh, lends itself to a much stronger shape or much stronger shell just because of the shape. Even before we start building it with the technology of our shells, the shape itself lends itself to a much stronger uh, protective device. Wonderful. Any questions on anything? Did I skip anything that you might want to no, no, know no. about? Okay. I'm, ha I'm happy to see that. In fact, the helmet even looks simpler to some degree than the last one, vent-wise and whatnot. It's even they even almost they remove things that were in, uh, now unnecessary. So to get a product that becomes simpler. That's not something I see in today's world very often. Everything just gets more complex and more possibilities for issues. So I'm kind of, uh, kind of excited to see that. And one thing I did forget to mention is the chin vent is, uh, obviously it's front and foremost. It's the first thing that gets hit by bugs or rocks and uh, when they crack. The previous X-D4 was not easy to replace that vent. Mm -hmm. um, the new one does have a set screw. You can replace it in a matter of seconds yourself. So it's something that the consumer can do you know, uh, without sending the helmet back in or without any right, must. Right. Um, so basically, that was a bonus. As always, all of our vents are held on with double-sided tape. They're designed to be frangible, break away, crush, in an impact, get out of the way, do not interfere with the crash at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want them interjecting any rotation or any kind of momentary stop that might send energy into the helmet. So everything we do, again, is designed for performance, protection first, then ventilation. Um, so again, one of the things we do is you know, approach from a very simple standpoint, but also a very protective standpoint, because Mr. I is very serious about the helmets he sells to his customers. He wants to make sure that there is no 
question as to whether or not we did our very best. So every helmet we sell is with the very best intentions of protecting the rider. So it's uh, every time people ask us questions, we go into that full explanation of why we do what we do. And I love when people come away with that conversation saying, oh, I understand that's fantastic, thank you. You know, it's, it's really nice that they question it, but then they accept the answer and they understand the reason behind everything we do. So these kind of videos help us get that message across to a wider audience, uh, a little more visible or visual uh, than just a phone call. But we still like those phone calls. So if people want to call and ask, we will uh, we'll give you any answer you need to, to help you understand the helmet better. Absolutely. Well, I have not yet ridden this helmet, uh, but I'm very excited to do so. I was happy with my other helmet that I rode for 10 years, the X-T4. So I'm kind of excited to get this on my head and uh, get riding. Cool. Yeah, and I think you're going to love it. I think it's uh, it's... It's one of those things where I'm a long oval shape. I have, I have a signet head. Um, as we talked earlier, we, we do multiple shapes for different interiors. Um, the average person is intermediate oval, so most of our helmets are intermediate. I'm a signet long oval. Uh, I wore signets on my left. I can wear them you know, for days on end. Uh, this helmet isn't intermediate, but it fits me extremely well. I'm very comfortable in it. And as it breaks in more and more to my head shape, it is one of those helmets where I could probably ride all day long in it. It's something I haven't said before in any of the other intermediate helmets. I can't wear a Corsair all day long. I can wear it for a track day or for a few hours, mm. but it's not something I'm comfortable in for hours and hours on end. This helmet I could ride for hours and hours on end, even though it's not technically shaped for my head. So it's one of those things where the longer you wear on a ride, the more it will custom shape itself to your head. The EPS liner will start to give. I have a point in the back of my head. Every one of my helmets has a little divot in the back where that little point has nested itself and basically it alleviates pressure. So this helmet has become my helmet. It actually fits me extremely well. So for all the people out there that asked about an intermediate or a long oval um, XD, it's not a long oval, but I think most of you will find that this helmet fits you extremely well uh, if you were looking for a little bit more uh, front to back room. So, uh, you know, I, I hope everyone gives it a chance and understands that uh, it's, it is a different animal. It is every evolution of a model, even though we try and keep it similar. They always evolve. There's always some change that we have to look for and find out what happened. I think it happened for the best. So I'm really happy that this helmet lets me ride for you know a whole day without any pressure points. Um, one thing I also mentioned before we get going, because uh, I am long-winded, people always say, you know, can you keep it short? I don't think so. I usually can't keep it short. You ask me a question, I'm going to give you the whole answer, whether you want to hear it or not. Um, part of the uh, aspect of adventure touring, a lot of times people ask, when is the ride going to do radios? Are you going to ever do you know, Bluetooth radios that come with your helmet or not? Mr. Ride doesn't know radios. I don't want to deal with radios. I don't want to take away from my focus of making helmets. I make the best helmets in the world. You go find the radio you want and you install it. I'll try and make it easier for you to install on my helmets. So basically, we retuned or reshaped the shell. And our hyper ridges at the bottom of the shell help strengthen the bottom to migrate um, or to minimize how much uh, shell damage or cracking might run off the edge of the helmet. So we put these ridges or bands around the bottom to strengthen this giant hole at the bottom. Um, but that interfered with radios and how to install a, a comm system on the shell because the shell had some undulations. So what we did was we sculpted and repositioned uh, the hyper ridges around the shell and left a flat spot on either side that allows you to either clip on or double side tape the radio system uh, a little more secure, a little easier uh, than it might have been in the past. The cheek pads uh, will come with a Velcro dot so you can just put my, uh, speakers in the ear pocket. As always, the right ear pockets are quite large and they accept um, speakers quite easily. And you can actually move them around to find the optimum spot for your ear position. So there's so much room that you can actually move them and customize them for your head shape. And then there's a little Velcro patch on the chin liner to help mount uh, your microphone. Uh, that's part of a European regulation for accessories. So we basically made it uh, universal for almost any radio to install. There's little pockets in the neck roll that will take excess wire and actually allow you to run the wire from left to right without letting stuff dangle or tucking them up behind things. So it makes it a lot easier to put the radio in, but we, we leave the choice up to you, which radio you want to get. We're not radio people, we're helmet people. So we just wanted to help the process without completely abandoning you know, the desire to have radios because I've ridden for hours and it's nice to be able to talk to people, get directions, make a phone call. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nice convenience. Um, but for the most part, at a ride, we ride to escape and get lost in our thoughts and just ride and enjoy the scenery. So radios aren't first and foremost in our minds, but we do pay attention for the customer. Radios and technology also change so much that you would never want to be locked into a certain technology on a helmet. It would date the helmet too quickly. 
I agree. It's much better to separate those two things, which is what I've always done, and it's worked just fine. Yep. So with the XT5, the legend continues on, which I'm happy about, and I cannot wait to get my hands or my head onto one of these. Thank you, Brian, for joining us today. A lot You're of welcome. information. Yep. Much appreciated. Well, I thank you for letting me run on, and hopefully there was some good information. And again, any questions or issues, let me know, and we'll, we'll try and help you guys out. We'll come back and do it again if we have to. As long as you'll uh, put up with me, I'll be here. We'll put up with you. <laughs> as long as you bring a lot of samples. Absolutely. Thanks for joining.